It's been a tremendous blessing <clears throat> since the first conference I remember that started in our home. As Brother Ian mentioned, I was a six or seven year old, and there's probably a tenth of the number of people who are here. And we would spill over from our living room into the outside porch, and then when the outside porch and the side room got too big, we'd spill over into the, what's today our gateway. For those of you who walked, we'd set up a little pundle, and then um, I think it almost got to the point where we had to open the gates. Um, and it's a tremendous joy to see how the Lord has, has blessed um, the church here, and it's been a blessing to me to be part of this family. It has taught me humility. It has taught me humility, and it's been the goals that I have sought to set, what we've heard here, humility, humility, humility. What Brother Ian spoke, the trophies, and any of the success in this world, we leave outside the door as we walk in the sanctuary of the temple of God. In the house of God, we are brothers and sisters, we're disciples, and the Lord has been really gracious to surround me with brothers and sisters who can be uh, a point of influence, a point of, of grace and advice to me through my years, for which I'm eternally grateful. I consider the Bangla Fellowship my home. It's been a tremendous joy for, for me to come back every year. I think since um, I left in 1987, in the last 20 years, the Lord's given us grace, given me grace to be here at least 10 or 15 times. And I praise God for that because it has really kept me close to my roots. What I want to talk about today is really targeted towards those of you who are, especially in your 20, between the ages of 20 and 40. How many of you here are between the age of 20 and 40? That's almost 60 or 70 percent in this room. And praise God for this younger generation. When we started the fellowship, uh, most of the leaders were in their 20s and 40s. Brother Newton was, I think, in your 20s. Brother Ian, maybe in late 30s. I know my dad was in the late 30s, early 40s. And now this new generation, between ages of 20 and 40, I'm 38, will be the, the, the generation that will carry the banner for the Lord. And most of us, 99% of us who are in our 20s and 40s, may not serve the Lord full time. We will have a job. We will have a job in our workplace. And with a lot of what's going on in India, where a lot of increase in high-tech investment, many of you are faced with pressures between your ages of 20s and 40s that your parents never faced. There is more money that's around the world. People have said that in 20 years, India and China will be one of the most, the biggest economies in the world. And a lot of this temptation now that the West faced in the last 20 and 40 years, India will face for those of you in that age. And it doesn't have to be just money. It will be power, it will be greed, uh, it will be many of other things. And I want to share a little bit of what the Lord's put on my heart as a blessing to those of you who are in the, the ages of 20 and 40 uh, and who seek to be disciples of the Lord in the workplace. I have not been called to the ministry that my father has to, 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 to be able to be a teacher and a preacher for the Lord full time. I believe the Lord has called me in my work setting to be an example. Uh, and I want to share with you what the Lord has put on my heart. And hopefully it's a blessing for many of you who are not just here uh, from Bangalore and from the other churches. You're probably visitors here today. My prayer is that we will be disciples of the Lord. Nothing in this world counts uh, if we are caught on earth and we can't rise up higher. The principles of this world teach you come up higher in the corporate world. The principles of heaven teach you often humility. Whether or not you rise in the corporate world, we rise in the heavenlies. Before I, I start, I want to ask first off some questions, uh, just to see if we can, we don't have to answer them, but you can ponder them. I wonder how many of you think you can be on fire for God and still have a secular job? Or do you believe that the only people who can be on fire for God are those who preach from the pulpit here, or for those who have a public ministry, who've written lots of books, or are leaders in your church? Has the Lord only called them, or has the Lord called you, between the ages of 20 and 40 especially, to be on fire for God even in a full-time secular job? 
Can you have a career at that corporate job? Or do you have to say that if, if uh, the Lord has given you a promotion or you are aspirationally looking for one um, that isn't in the will of God, you have to just work in, a very, uh, in your same job? What do we think about that? What do you do when the Lord, for those of you who have just finished college, just finished college and you've been praying and you get a job and you get your first paycheck, you get your first salary, what do you do with that? How do we live as, as godly disciples when the Lord first gives us money or when the Lord gives us a little bit more, whatever that circle of influence is? Do you know that wherever you are, it doesn't have to be one where you're a leader in the church. The Lord has called each one of us to be leaders. Specifically, the Lord has called each of us to be shepherds. And I want to talk about that because there is a big need more and more as we grow older for us not to be just ones who take. Our entire life is often taking. From the time we're a young child, we take from our parents. And the Lord calls us wherever we are, first off in the body of Christ where the Lord has placed us, to give and to give to those who are younger than us, wherever it might be, as shepherds. And in that capacity, we don't have to be up here in the pulpit, we don't have to be a leader in our specific church, but we can be a leader in a small capacity. It may be a leader in my home, where my only circle of influence are my wife and my child, or the children the Lord give me. It may be in the leader in the work among my peers, among those the Lord gives me responsibility for. Wherever it is the Lord's calling more and more, especially for the young people, is to be a leader. Is your life compartmentalized, compartmentalized into a spiritual life that you live on certain days when certain people see you? And then a professional life where 80 or 90 percent of your day you spend at the workplace and it's a different person that they see. It's a John that they see on Sunday morning or on Wednesday nights. And then there's another John that they see at work. Are you specifically a friend of Christ on Sunday or the, 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 the days that you are at the church meetings and a friend of the world the rest of the week? Just to, show my, to prove my, my, my illustration here, I want to show you all this wonderful basket of fruit. Everybody can see it? Now, if I were to ask you from a distance there to come and point out to a particular piece of fruit that you would like to partake of, and we did this during the youth conference. We had 50 or 60 people in a room, and we had 10 eager volunteers who jumped up and were eager to grab 10 pieces of fruit. And they came up to a piece of fruit, and so one of them took it, and I asked them to take a bite out of the piece of fruit like I am, like I am right now. And some of them took a piece of bite, and it felt very juicy. And there are other people who took a piece of bite, and they couldn't bite. And I asked them, why couldn't you bite? It was a false fruit. This fruit and this fruit look almost identical to each other. You couldn't tell from a distance. One is, in fact, a fake piece of, of apple, a fake apple, and this is a real apple. In this box of fruit, if I really did the test and you know, shook it, or tried to poke at it, or see if it was hollow, you'll find out that seven or eight out of these fruit here, seven or eight out of the twelve of the fruit here are actually fake. And for many of us, I use this illustration because we can be one of those fruits. We can be a fruit that is real throughout the week. On Sunday, being a blessing to others, the fruits of the Spirit. Or we can be one that looks good. And when the trials and tribulations come to us in the workplace, where we spend 80 to 90 percent, many of us uh, wake up early in the morning, especially men who are working where you have a one hour. Sometimes I heard in Bangalore there's an hour, hour and a half commute. You wake up at five or six in the morning on a Monday. You get ready and then you go to work and you may come back only late in the night. And then you may have an hour or two before you go to sleep. 80 or 90 percent of your work, of your, of your life, is spent outside place where a lot of believers may see you. And in that place, the Lord calls us to be true fruit so that the people of the world and the people of God can see and can drink and eat of this fruit. And way too often, we live hypocritical lives where our lives at the workplace 
is different from what we live on Sunday or on Wednesday evening. And the Lord is calling us to true, simple love for Him, where irrespective of what day of the week it is, we have that passion for Christ all the time. He is Lord of our life, despite the fact we have to work. I talked about shepherds, and this is really, really important, because it's been a burden on my heart more and more that the Lord would give me a, a burden for others that I can, I can be a shepherd to. And it may be just, as I explained earlier, a small sphere of influence, and it may start with just my family. But when you are a young boy or a young girl, as you grow up, the Lord will give you someone in your circle of influence because he's called us to be a disciple to all the world. Someone in your circle of influence that he's calling you to be a shepherd to. We talked about this on the Sunday at, at church. And it may be a Sunday school. It may be just a small set of Sunday school children. It's amazing when all of us play football on the field, you see all the young children watching around the fence. What do you think they're watching? They're watching to see who gets angry, who loses, who gets intense. And of course, they may go back and talk about this among them, themselves. You know that, right? The young children talk about themselves. You know that he did this and he did this and, and all that happens. We are, we're called to be examples and be a shepherd and a leader wherever we are. One of the things that I am I'm so immensely grateful for is that many of the brothers that I saw growing up, brothers like Brother Ian and Brother Newton, they have had a heart of a shepherd. And the heart of a shepherd often isn't necessarily the one who is an evangelist and a preacher. But they are behind the scenes, praying, ministering, spending time with the, those who are young. And now it is on us, many of us who have grown older and are not in our, our under 10 or in our teens, but we're between the ages of 20 and 40. We can't depend on the older brothers to be our shepherds. The Lord is calling us. In fact, a, I talked about this as a big sign that says, Wanted. Just like you have a job ad or a billboard that says, looking for more um, men or women, engineers or Wipro or TCS or whoever is looking for people. Imagine that you had a sign. The Lord has got a sign that's saying, He, wanted, he looks for more shepherds. The, the, when Jesus was looking at the people, He felt compassion for them because they were dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. I wonder how many of us have that. Because it's when we have that heart and attitude starting in the place where the Lord has set us, in the body, that we can take those values into the world. If we don't have our shepherd's heart um, in the place where the Lord has kept us in the church, we will never have that type of attitude. We will look to be constantly served rather than to, to serve. The other thing is who we seek advice from. Um, most often there are today... Too many of the young people who look to advice from impure advisors. It may be pastors or preachers who are not preaching the word of God. It may be psychologists. It may be, and this is what Zechariah 10 verse 2. If I were to paraphrase it into today, for those of you who read that, that, that verse, it talks about people who were going to the diviners, the, uh, the, the, the people who would look for, for advice from false and evil spirits. And today, many of us are looking from, from the wrong shepherds for that piece of advice. Or when the Lord does give us responsibility, in Zechariah 11:17, there's a, there's a strict warning. When you're given responsibility and you shun it, when the Lord's given us responsibility and we ignore it, it says, woe unto people who are shepherds who have shunned their responsibility. Instead, the Lord is calling us to be like Jesus, where the good shepherd puts the sheep before himself. Always. There, there are also, all, we see so many examples of people who act as hired men. This is in fact the translation from the message. A hired man is not a real shepherd. The sheep mean nothing to him. He sees a wolf coming and he runs away, leaving the sheep to be, sheep to be ravaged by the wolf. The sheep don't matter to him. And I say this because it really is important that we understand the principles of what the Lord wants us to be as shepherds, in the body of Christ. Because when we have learned that in the body of Christ, we're able to take that into our value system as leaders, whatever, whether the Lord has made us just an individual contributor or whether the Lord makes us a manager uh, or if the Lord makes us a vice president or a CEO. It doesn't matter. Uh, if the Lord has given us the heart of a shepherd for the people of God, 
then we're able to take these values and make them part of ours. I would encourage you, especially those of you who are young, ask the Lord, Lord, give me the heart of a shepherd. Give me the heart of a shepherd who can look for those who are in need, to not be one who is only looking to take, but to be the one who can look to bless. So what I want to talk about today are three things. Uh, the values, the goals, and decisions that we can live our Christian life in the workplace. And I'm primarily, again, speaking to those of you who are in a secular job, knowing very well the type of pressures we all face. I can relate to that over the last 16 years that I have had a job. And the Lord has taken me through places where I feel like it's success, and there are times where I feel like it's failure. And through it all, I have sought to pray that the Lord would preserve my values that are godly values. And I'm going to share with you a few that I've put down for my own life. Uh, I shared this during the youth conference. Uh, and I pray that the Lord may use this in some fashion. I would ask you to think about them and write them down for yourself in terms of what you, we want our own values to be. One of the things that has really blessed me is a verse that we had at our home, in the upstairs of our home, um, that basically said from the Psalms, I will make the godly my heroes. And it's a tremendous verse. It's in the Living Bible. And think about the fact that we can learn from those who are in the Bible as the godly examples, but also those who we see who are perhaps lived in the last century or in the last two or three centuries, or those who we see in our church today. I mentioned examples of the shepherds in, in examples like Brother Ian and Brother Newton. It's a tremendous a way for us to be able to relate to how these godly people of God uh, live their lives. And one of my heroes in the Old Testament is Joseph. I don't know how many of you know this. I share this in the youth conference. But any of you know what Joseph was doing in his 20s? The answer, he was in prison. Most of you will hear in the world that in your 20s are when you are supposed to build the foundation stone for your career. The worldly values are you go to college, you get a good education, you get a good job, and in your 20s, you lay the foundation stone. In your 30s, you build on that. In your 40s, you start, and then in your 50s, you retire. That's the traditional. Every um, class where they teach you how to, to, to think about your career, that's how they think about this. Think about Joseph, the person who eventually became the number two person in the world. Egypt was the biggest country, and think about being the number two person uh, in the world. He, he spent his most formative years in prison for something that he didn't even do. He acted according to his principles and he was sent to prison. And I have found in my own life that it's in those times when the Lord takes me through a physical or a spiritual, it doesn't have to be a physical prison, but a spirit, what feels like a, a physical time of down or a physical failure uh, in life, what may feel like a prison. In life, those are the times where the Lord is preparing, preparing me for whatever he may have next. Whether it's success or whether it's, it's not success in, in, in the world's eyes. And um, I have been tremendously encouraged by the example of Joseph, who stood with God as a man of principle. I would encourage you, those who are young boys, to read the book of, the book of Genesis and observe the life of Joseph and the, what he said between the ages of 20 and 30. And ask yourself, can I live that life, whether I'm in prison, whether I'm put in front of a king, how do I stay bold in front of God? And if you think about the ministry that Joseph had, he was the reason that the Jewish race was preserved. If Joseph had not been sent to prison, had not been sent eventually to Egypt during those seven years of famine, the generation of Abraham would have ended. So the Lord had a very specific purpose for Joseph. He didn't know when he was in prison whatever was going to happen, whether he was going to be the number two person uh, in Egypt or whether he was going to have his head chopped off. He lived his life by way of those simple principles where he was not going to compromise. And that's one of our heroes. That's one whom I would ask all of us brothers and sisters to consider our heroes, non-compromisers. Another example, many of you who are here have seen this play that was enacted um, a couple of years ago and was actually done 20 years ago in 1987. I remember we did this, the small version of this play for those of you who were children at the time. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? 
You remember the three friends of Daniel who stood true to God in uh, a time where there was compromise all around them. These were young boys who were 17, 18, the tradition, history tradition tells us. And they were simple young lads. But they set their heart on the site of God's kingdom. They were not going to compromise. And while we have seen these stories over and over again as Sunday school or in a play, we get the chance to face this in our life. Where somewhere, for the first time, for those of you who are 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, you're going to be faced with some compromise. Drinking of the king's wine or eating of the king's food, whatever that might mean in your work setting. Participating in company that you shouldn't be at. Compromising, bribing, whatever it might be. And when we take a stand for the Lord, the Lord honors us. The Lord honored these, these three men and Jesus was in the middle of that group. The Son of God was in the middle of the group when they were thrown into the flames. Now, whether we get thrown into the flames and we survive or not, that's not the point. There were many Christians in the first century who were thrown in front of the lions, who were thrown uh, through the, uh, through, to, the li- to, to the flames, and they died. Whatever the ending of the story is, we know that our promise and our crown is in heaven, so we will not compromise. And God needs more and more of us who are especially in that age group, those 20 years, to build a foundation stone where we learn early on that is, we are not going to please men. We're going to please God. And it's so, we hear this so often from the pulpit, but it's been my experience that in those years, especially for those of you who are in those ages, we get an opportunity again and again to be tested whether we will compromise. And only, the only people who know that are the Holy Spirit, us, our conscience, and the people around us. We may not have the brothers and sisters from CFC or the different fellowship here watching us. We will know whether we're that fake apple or the real apple when we come into a situation like this. Or Daniel himself. In, um, in the, the story, we know that there were three different kings that happened. Nebuchadnezzar, Belteshazzar, and Darius. And in all three of those kings, uh, Daniel was the, still a leader uh, in a senior role there. Most of you know in companies, when they have a new management that comes in, they usually you know, remove the old guard and bring in the new guard, as they say. But Daniel was such a man of God, he lived not just upright, he was respected that irrespective of all the management changes or the new kingship, they retained Daniel because they saw his uprightness. And you can be sure that when you have that type of success, there will be enemies. And there were enemies that Daniel had. Um, And again, he was not ashamed to pray before God three times. And, and And we will be tested the same way. Are we ashamed to talk about Jesus uh, in, in the workplace? Are we ashamed to pray before our meals when we're sitting in the cafeteria? These are small but symbolic examples of where someone watches that and asks us, what were you doing? And it's a place where we can early on in our life learn what it is to have the godly values. Or Nehemiah. Here is an example of a, of a person. The tradition says that he was probably around 30 years old, actually 40 years old, when he um, heard about the destruction in Jerusalem and the walls of Jerusalem. Think of those of us who are getting close to 40. His heart was not uh, in, in Babylon. His heart was in Jerusalem. And he set it on himself to go and rebuild the walls. He was not Ezra, who was called to a full-time, uh, to be a priest. He was a secular man who, during his spare time, sought to build the walls of, of Jerusalem. His passion was building the walls of Jerusalem so there could be a barrier between Babylon uh, and Jerusalem. And you can be sure, just like there was Daniel, there was Sanballat and there was Tobiah, there were enemies of Nehemiah who came. They tried to do everything to discourage him, first with words, then with weapons, then they plotted to actually kill him. And in all those, those situations, Nehemiah would go to the Lord in prayer. Again and again, for those of you who have read the, the story, you know, again and again, how Nehemiah, a man in the whole Old Testament, he didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit of all the wonderful things we know about in the New Testament, but he was a man of God who, in his workplace, a governor eventually, the cupbearer originally for, for the king, he was going to, his heart was set on building the wall. And we have a number of examples of, like this in the Old Testament. And it is just not men. There were women of God. 
Deborah was a woman of God who, who sat under the tree as we know. And even d- despite a general who was not bold enough to go on to victory, the Lord gave victory through her words and through a woman uh, who nailed, as you know, the nail into the, the, the king's head. So there are plenty of examples of men and women of God who I would ask you to keep as the godly in your heroes. Jesus himself taught us a set of values that are different. I use these examples because the set of values that we see from many of these, whether they were working people like Joseph or Daniel and Nehemiah, or Jesus who had a full-time ministry, and his value system was not rising up up, uh, in a corporate ladder or rising up in the world. His value system was servant leadership. And that's completely different. If you went to your workplace and told your manager, uh, or as you got a new promotion, the principles and the values that I am living my life on is servant leadership. They think you've gone crazy. Right? The, the system of the world is all about you serve me. I am the boss, I am the manager. And of course, when you are successful, when you do the work, I'll take credit for it, and then I will rise and get promoted. That's the world system. And, and the Lord has taught us to be servant leaders. Now, that's a gross example, but there are plenty of other places where this principle of servant leadership is so, imp- uh, so important. Jesus also taught his disciples values that are very different from the world. When we are going through a crisis in our life, the Lord reaches out to us and asks us to trust him almost in the impossible in the impossible, which is today symbolic of walking on water. The Lord asks us to trust Him. And I have found in my own life, that right now I'm going through a situation in my work where there's a lot of uncertainty. And I've prayed this prayer, Lord, teach me and show me how I can be more like Peter, who saw you in faith, whatever the situation might be, and not take my eyes off you. And as soon as Peter took his eyes off him, you know the story. And he was, fortunately, he was reached out to the Lord and said, help, help. So I pray that the Lord may use these examples of, 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 of godly believers in the, uh, and godly examples in the Old Testament, our own Lord and Jesus, uh, Savior Jesus Christ. The value system that the Lord teaches us is completely different from the value system in the world and is very, very important. Let me, just so you think that that was thousands of years ago, okay, and we can't relate to that. Many of you know this story of an amazing man, Eric Little. In 1924, this was, um, you know, almost 80 years ago, 83 years ago, he was an uh, incredible athlete. Many of you know the story. He was set to be probably the fastest man in the world running the 100 meters. And it was a known fact that the 100 meters event, the finals of the 100 meters, was going to be held on a Sunday in Paris. And he decided well before the Olympics... He told the organizers, don't even bother changing the date of the finals because he was going to be the, and you know how much, there's lots of acclaim given to the fastest man in the world. He said, I cannot run on Sunday, but don't change the event. I'm going to try and train for the 400 meters. And he, uh, he stood because of principle. It wasn't just the fact that he wanted to observe the Sabbath. He believed that God was first in his life. And we know the story that the, the day of the 400 meters, he was getting onto the starting tracks and someone slipped a small piece of paper into his hand. And on that piece of paper was this verse, 1 second, Sam, first Samuel 2 verse 30. Those who honor me, I will honor. And he ran that race and he won the race. Uh, he had also won previously uh, the 200 meters, the bronze medal there. And here was an amazing man of God. He gave up his career after that. He ran it for a few more years and became a missionary because he felt that's what the Lord was calling him. He didn't seek glory and fame anymore in the world. He felt that that was enough. And he felt called to inner China. And for those of you who know how the, what, what it looked like in the 1920s in, in inner China, it wasn't even near the cities, And for those of us who have read many of the the examples of missionaries who have sacrificed a lot, here was one example, Eric Little, who sacrificed a lot, and he went to China, and uh, shortly thereafter he got married, he he brought his children to China, it was very hard for his wife because his wife got sick a lot, so he sent his wife back, 
uh, with his children. And then there was a big Japan-China war. And, and Eric Little was an example even in, in confinement, in the prison setting. Uh, it's said in a lot of the stories about him that a lot of the other missionaries during this time of oppression and hardship during the Japan-China war acted very selfishly. When they got food, they would hoard it for themselves. Eric Little would consistently look to, to take his food and give it to the Chinese who were being tortured by the Japanese. He would use, intelligently use hockey games to break up fights inside the prison because he was an athlete. In fact, one of his, his daughters said that um, he, was so, he would use his speed. You know, as you know, he was, was a very, very fast athlete. He would use his speed to run in the jungles and catch rabbit and bring it back for the Chinese in the prison to eat. Lots of stories of his heroics, not in the public eye for a gold medal, but he won a gold medal in the prison setting where he served God unselfishly. unselfishly. The Japanese apparently would say that they would only trust Eric Little to make the food because they couldn't trust that anybody else wouldn't poison the food. And they only trusted that Eric would, would be able to. Finally, when it got close to about the 1940s, the, the Prime Minister of, of, of England, Winston Churchill, uh, was able to, to organize a prisoner exchange. And it came time for Eric Little to be exchanged as a prisoner for somebody else that they had exchanged, uh, that they were going to exchange to the Japanese. And Eric Little said, no, I'm not going to uh, offer myself. Here is a pregnant woman who needs to go back to England. And he stayed there. His, his health became worse and worse, and he finally died of a brain tumor. Um, he was malnourished and overworked. And he died just four years older than me at the age of 42. And here are examples of godly men, whether the Lord calls us to be a missionary or, or not, who gave up what may be viewed as fame and fortune. He could have won probably the gold medal in the 1928 Olympic Games. He was very fast and he was young. He was only uh, 22 years old um, when, they, when, the, when we ran the first Olympics. And he could have run probably one more time. But he gave that up because his goal and his value system were in heaven. So I wanted to share with you a couple of these examples and I have set for myself um, um, uh, about 10 values that I have set as a, uh, as a system that I want to put before the Lord. Many of these examples are values that I would say that I say before the Lord, I'm in need, Lord, I need more help to be able to live these values. Here is a simple diagram that can help you understand how you can think about this. The values are who you define and they are with you for your life. You see often... I saw this from the point I was a young uh, boy in Clarence School. You would see boys whose parents were dishonest, constantly dishonest. They had shops and they had stores and they were dishonest. And their children learned dishonesty and they thought it was okay because their parents were that way. And they went from third standard, sixth standard, ninth standard, tenth standard. They were dishonest. And today, guess what? They're teaching dishonesty to their children. The value system that we have and who we def will define us for the rest of our life and it will define also often our children. The goals are what we set for ourselves for a short or for a long period of time and the decisions are what we make every day. And in these three parts, I want to share with you how we can live our lives as a Christian in the workplace where our values, the, the foundation stone that we live on, can be set on godly values like these many heroes that we heard about. The goals that we set for ourselves, whether it is for 2008 or for the rest of our life, can be godly goals. Um, and then the decisions we make every day are guided by the principles uh, that are in the scriptures. So I want to share with you now, fairly quickly, ten values that I have put down for myself. I shared this at the, um, the, the youth conference. Um, and I, I've coupled them to scripture, uh, and I hope it's a blessing. Number one, I will seek to make my life on earth and observe that my life on earth is vapor. I'm a citizen of heaven. And there are verses here that you can take away in James 4, verse 13 to 15. It says, do you not know what your life will be like tomorrow? You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. Or in Philippians 3, verse 20, it says, For many walk, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is their same, whose end is destruction, but our citizenship is in heaven. 
In 1 Peter 2, verse 9, 12, you know this verse. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. It is very important. The value number one that I put down here is that we are conscious of the fact that whatever, whether we have success or failure in the workplace, that we are citizens in heaven. And it doesn't matter whether we feel like we've lost our job or we're not getting a promotion uh, or we're not yet finding a job. Think about the, if you were living in a foreign country, not just perhaps a foreign country, you're living in a hostile country, you were living in a place that was a war, in the Middle East or Iraq. How much you would long to, be, to come home at the end of that assignment. That should be our attitude, whether the Lord gives us success or not. My citizenship and the time that I live on this earth is going to be so short compared to everything uh, and eternity. May it never be said that I have looked to profit on this earth and then have missed out completely, uh, as you know about the story of the rich man. The second value, I will work hard in everything that I do. If the Lord grants me success, I will fall on my knees in humility, praying for grace to be faithful. And there's, there's verses of scripture here. We don't have to look at all of them. Colossians 3 talks about doing heartily for the Lord. Do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Again, my work ethic, often I find, it's, it, uh, we, there are not enough b b Christians who are willing to work hard. They often feel like, well, my, my, uh, my citizenship is in heaven, so if I waste time at work or if I have lots of free time, and if I just goof off, that's okay. The Lord has called us to be examples where when He gives us a project, we do it to the best of our ability, to the very best of our ability. We see that in the examples of Daniel, in the examples of Joseph. All of God's people are hardworking people. And it also, for young people, especially for those of you before you get married, it's a tremendous, um, it's a tremendous lifesaver also. There's a saying, as we know, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. It's a tremendous lifesaver when we're young, when we can work hard and when we end the workday, we're tired. And we come back, we go back to sleep and we start the next workday and the only free time we have is for the Lord's people. Imagine how much it saves us. If you look at many of your friends, they're looking to work the least and then go and have lots of parties and, and, and good times. But if we can, when we're young people, learn how it, what it means to work hard. Then as we get older, and we have a family, and we realize the Lord blesses us when we work hard. Then comes the opposite, which is we perhaps have to learn how it is to pull back and say to our, our manager or to our bosses, I'm sorry, I can't do this, so I really am not willing to do this because it's really putting, it's too much work that I have to take uh, time to, to be with my family or to be with the people of God or whether it's a conference, or whether it's a, a, a regular work meeting day, or Sunday, whatever it is, the, you know the specific situation. Uh, there it comes a point where, in humility, we have to pray before the Lord and say, Lord, give me guidance on how I can maintain these values. When the Lord gives us success, we go before the Lord in humility and say, Lord, you're opposed to the proud. And if I, it's by my experience that the Lord often will find us ways by which He can keep us humble. He'll bring failures into our midst. I found often in a couple, in a couple of settings, this happened to me uh, four years ago. And it's not because we're not doing our job well. We may be doing our job very well, but there's politics that comes into a situation. In the situation I was in four years ago, the CEO of my company didn't like me. And he decided that he wanted to hire somebody else. So in literally, uh, I lost my job there. And I found during that point in time, it was a tremendous opportunity for me to humble myself. If I thought I was being successful, the Lord humbled me immediately. The other points in time, and I'll share this as a, a little humorous example, where the Lord also uses simple situations that may happen at work for other people to get uh, a laugh at your expense. And that's okay. This situation happened to me actually three, four years ago. And I was here in, uh, in India, actually, in Bangalore. Um, it was uh, Sunil's wedding. It was 2004. And uh, we had a conference call for some work that I was doing. And uh, most of my team was in the U.S. So it was, you know, uh, at some unearthly hour of the night. I think it was at 2 o'clock in the morning. 
uh, in the midday in the U.S. and, and the middle of the night here. And we had all our team on the conference call. And here I was on the phone. And in the middle of the call, it was late in the night, I fell asleep. Okay? Not just that I fell asleep, I started snoring. Okay? And of course, everybody on the end, rest of the phone, I, uh, I heard them say at some point in time, because I woke up and said, Sanjay, is that you? Because uh, they heard the snore. And I was so embarrassed, I disconnected the phone. Uh, I didn't want them to know. But of course, that became a joke. And a lot of people had, uh, when I left that job a few years later, jokes to talk about my snoring. And there are plenty of ways in which the Lord will use simple, like simple things like that to keep us humble. Uh, and if we can just allow those type of situations, if it's something that's a, a joke at our own expense, for us to just laugh it off. But if there are other times when it's a serious uh, place where we are humbled. Uh, if the Lord can use us during those times to find that our identity as we heard about. Our identity is in Christ. So many of us, especially young men, we suffer from the fact that we want to find our identity in something else. It might be in the person we want to marry, or it might be often, for those of you in a career, it might be your job. And the Lord will find ways by which He will destroy that identity and say, now I'm going to take that Isaac that was yours and the one that you thought was precious, and I'm going to find a way to humble, it, humble you. And may the Lord use those, those times where it feels lonely, where it feels like it's, uh, it's, not, if it, where it's a failure. The Lord uses us to say, I've got something better in store with you, even if it's not on this earth. I will be a light, number three, I will be a light on the hill, salt in the, in the food, keeping my Christian behavior excellent, so others can glorify God. The Lord has called us in the workplace to be two kinds. A light on a hill is one that stays right up there, Everybody can see it. It's not sitting underneath. It's a light in the hill. And we know we sing that song as, as, um, uh, as it's, it's a Sunday school song, This Little Light of Mine. And it stayed in my head even as I've gotten older, to my 20s and to my 30s. And think about when the Lord puts you in an example, if you can sing that song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm going to let it shine. And there are other times where you won't be a light, but you will be salt in the food. And salt, you can't see it. It actually sits inside the food, but you can taste it. Uh, you can taste it and it, it's, it, you know when the food is salty and you know when the food is not salty. Um, and a calling to us is so that our righteousness not just is above the worldly people, but above the so-called Christians. Those are the, 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 the Pharisees of today. Number four, I will be open to the direction of the Holy Spirit wherever it might lead, whatever it leads me to speak and to act. And we know the fact that today... The reason we can follow in the footsteps of Jesus is because we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come and will teach us and will be with our conscience, that helper. When we find that we need a guide and there's nobody to help us, we don't have a brother we can go to, we can't call them up on the phone and we're praying in the middle of our day. The, the Lord Jesus has promised us the Holy Spirit and, and we should ask and pray that the Lord will anoint us with power. So that whether or not um, uh, we are around the brothers that we can seek guidance from, the Holy Spirit will be our guide. And be prepared. And it says here in 2 Timothy 4, this doesn't apply just in uh, the place where we may on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning. It may be in the workplace, in season or out of season. The out of season might be when you're out in work. The in season might be when you're in the fellowship meetings. To be able to share the word with boldness. Number five, when the Lord gives you um, money, whether it's little or whether it's less, whether it's more, I will be generous with the seed the Lord has given me. And we know a number of different verses here. I would encourage you, for those of you who have a, a, a book of, the, of the, the practical discipleship, to read chapter three. There is much that we can learn about, about how to give and to give cheerfully. I have been tremendously blessed to watch my parents give of their lives. It was my mother's birthday uh, two days ago, and we have developed a tradition in our family over the last few years, at the, the day of a person's birthday, to go around the table and honor them. And I, um, I spoke of my mother, and, and all, of, uh, all of us spoke around the table. And I, I said that it's been, to me, a tremendous joy to watch somebody who by worldly standards, had all things going. She was probably going to be the head of her medical institute in Velour. 
Uh, she was very accomplished, but she gave that up, not just to, uh, to serve in a leprosy mission, but also to serve in the body of Christ behind the scenes. And she's been an example. This is an example where it's not money, but it was time, it was career, whatever the Lord has given, that we can sow generously before the Lord. And many of you have examples of that in your, uh, uh, in your local setting. Appreciate them and learn from them. And may the Lord give us grace to also be the ones who can sow generously in whatever it is, whether it's money, if it's time, in whatever form uh, the Lord has given us. Number six, and this is a really, really important one. I will do nothing out of selfish ambition. And this is again completely contrary to the world system. When I went to business school, and for those of you who have been to a, a business training, or if you go to a training class that they send you to, they teach you all about ambition. It's all about having ambition to get to place X or to drive up in a corporate ladder. And it's okay to have certain goals and ambitions if the Lord has given us grace to do well. But the world system is completely one which is based on selfish ambition. Um, we have a number of examples. You know them in your, in your workplace of examples of people who take the credit for something that their team does and then basically goes and trumpets it to their management as their own work. You see that again and again. And you look at them and they're successful. And you say, how can someone be so aggressive, so uh, constantly looking out for themselves? And, uh, and they just seem to be successful. And here I am, I'm, I'm humble, and the Lord is not you know, giving me success. For one, the tables are turned on, on all those in the kingdom of God. And in heaven, the last will be first. Not just that, you can see, invariably, even on this earth, I have noticed even those who have uh, sown in a certain way, they reap even on this earth, where typically, where that type of setting is, is present among managers and among the people in the workplace, you quickly start seeing a lot of every evil thing that it says here. Um, uh, and, and, and so on, where every selfish ambition, that there is disorder and every evil thing. Things start going chaotically in the workplace, and it's clearly an example of, of this principle. The next value, I will be a servant leader. I will not seek my own glory. Instead, I will seek to honor God, praise and encourage and improve those around me, above me and beneath me. And this, again, is very much tied to the, the, the previous one, where there's no selfish ambition. Servant leadership is not something that you learn in, for those of you who are in work and they've taken you to a, um, a place where you learn about improving your skills. It's not about servant leadership. It's all about being able to, to, to run things completely differently from the principles uh, of, of the gospel. And for those of us who have learned this, I find that, that when we are able to learn this early on in our life, where well, we're constantly looking out like Jesus for the faint-hearted, for the weak, and seeking to encourage and nourish them. Uh, and in your work setting, it may be either one of your peers that you work with that you notice is less accomplished uh, or is struggling, and you're able to use some of your own time to help them, even if you don't get the credit for it. And then when the Lord gives you responsibility to be a manager, and you have a team underneath you, where you look out for the people who are the weakest in that team, and you're constantly looking not to see how you can get them fired, but to see how you can improve them. And this is completely, again, the opposite principles from the way the world works uh, in the workplace. Number eight, I will be careful with all my words and actions. And we know a number of verses in the book of James. It's been a tremendous joy for us in our Bible study to, to study the book of James. And James is so full of practical advice, especially about the tongue. And it is so amazing how this little tongue in the workplace, again, where nobody's watching us, is the rudder that moves our ship in a completely different direction from where our ship may be parked on Sunday morning or on Wednesday evening. And the Lord give us grace that we can be examples in humility, where we can go before the Lord and, the, and ask for grace, and we ask for forgiveness, where at times we haven't used our, our tongue in a wise um, fashion. And not just our, our tongue, also our actions. Number nine, I will seek the counsel of others frequently, and I, and I will make the godly my heroes. I have found that again, and I've seen a number of other Christians, uh, and even sometimes believers we've known in, in, in CFC and other places, 
who have thought they can do it all by themselves. And as they've gotten more and more successful, you find success going to their heads. They have less time to come and ask the brothers, the brothers who have helped them in early years of their life, less time to be thankful to those brothers who have sown seeds early in their lives because they now are the know-it-all. They have it all, they've accomplished, the Lord has given them more and they have less time uh, to seek out the counsel of the frequently, seek out the counsel of the wise frequently. And you see how often after a certain point in time, irrespective of the success they have in the world, the, 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 the Lord moves away from them. And it's, it's, uh, I have sought constantly to say, Lord, whatever the situation is, bring brothers and sisters into my life, even if I'm not physically in Bangalore, where I can see them. Thank God for email now, where we can, ans- we can ask questions, or we can communicate, we can ask for advice, and we can seek also those who have more wisdom than us. And often I find the people I learn from, even in my work setting, aren't people who have seen the same situation in a work setting. They aren't in a senior position in a company, but they have godly principles that they can point me to the Bible. And whether or not Jesus was not the CEO of a company, but his words are ones that can, can, can stand true to us, whatever our position is in the company, in a company. And take this verse to heart, that we can make our godly, our heroes. And finally, I will seek to be on fire for God, seeking to be a change agent, not satisfied with the status quo. And you see this in the life of J- Jesus. He didn't come as just another example of a, of, a, of a Pharisee or a prophet or a teacher who was going to get up on the Sabbath day and read. He shook things up. He was, in, from the first moment where he spoke at the age of 30, people were amazed as to who this man was. He shook things up. And the Lord has called us, wherever we are, that we stand out as an example and we, sh- we will often shake things up. We may be unpopular because we're different. Here's an example where, where even Paul said he was going to preach the gospel in places where Christ was not yet proclaimed. So he wouldn't just build on another person's uh, foundation. And with, through it all, I would pray, I've shared ten examples here, that the Lord would continuously keep us on fire. And being on fire for God isn't just a one-time thing or a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning thing. It's something that we can take into the workplace. It may be never said of us that we've lost that first love and gradually over time we become lukewarm because more success came to us. It's been my constant prayer. In fact, we are more in danger when the Lord brings us success and when the Lord brings us more money to go lukewarm. Because all the temptations we know come to us. Love of money, love of power. And when we go down on our knees, uh, and it's been my own prayer, Lord, if you bring success in my life, bring an equal share of humility. Find ways by which I can go down on my knees and pray so that I can constantly have my first love. Bring the, the pastors and the, 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 the teachers around me even if I'm not physically in the same place, where I can be counseled, where I can learn and hear of them uh, constantly so I can be on fire with you. So I would ask you, as you think about what your values are, write down on a piece of paper sometime before the new year. What are the values, especially, again, I'm talking to those of you who are in the working place, for those in your 20s, between 20 and 40. Write down, you don't have to write down 10, write down three or five of the values that you're going to stand for in the workplace. And these are the ones you're not going to compromise on. And ask yourself, can you live by these godly values, whether you're successful or not successful? And make this the prayer that you can pray for the Lord uh, to help you change in 2008. It is my own prayer. When I look at some of the ten that I shared with you, if I were to grade myself, I wouldn't score 100% on many of them. In fact, some of them, I'm not happy with where, where my score would be, if you were to think of that as, as a score. But I pray before the Lord and say, in need, Lord, make this area an area where I can come before you and make my life one where there's, for instance, no more selfish ambition. Okay, let's talk a little bit about goals and then decisions uh, in, in, the, in the next segment. Many of you know that, in, in the, in, as we described, values are what we keep with us through our life. They don't change. They are the the value system that we have. If we're dishonest, we will stay dishonest. We will teach our children dishonesty. Goals are ones that we set for ourselves 
over some period of time. Maybe it's a goal for 2008. And again, the corporate world always talks about goals that may be based on ones that are of selfishness and based on ones that are, uh, are of earthly values. Think about the types of goals that an athlete has. When you have your goal set, whether it's Eric Little or any other kind of athlete, to win a gold medal, you're constantly disciplining yourself. You get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and you run and you run and when you run two or three times it's not enough, you run again. You're lifting weights and you're constantly looking to discipline yourself. And how much more should it be when we are looking for a gold medal in the, heaven, in the heavenlies where we discipline our body and make it our slave, just like Paul said, so that we will not be disqualified. There are a couple of verses here that have been a tremendous encouragement to be, uh, as we set whatever goals there are. Again, I'm going to be set by goals that are first off winning a gold medal in the kingdom of God. Everything else is secondary. The crown of righteousness in heaven is so much more important than any kind of medal, whatever it might be or any kind of title on this earth. And then when the Lord brings us trials, whatever it might be at the workplace, we look at these trials and we welcome them. And we say, Lord, here is an example of a trial that you have brought to take what looks like iron and you're going to make it gold. And those of you who've seen the way in which gold is refined, it starts off and it's black and then it goes through the fire and all the black starts going away and it becomes more and more purified gold as it says in this verse in 1 Peter 1. And the Lord brings us those trials, especially the trials we face in the workplace and seeks to purify us. And may we look at those trials and say, Lord, I want to embrace those trials, even though it might feel like it's discouraging at the time. Lord, this is a trial that you have, you have brought me because if I persevere at the end of the trial, you have laid out a, a crown. And again, when we are young, these, this, this is the time in which we have that stamina, so to speak. You see, when athletes get to be 30 or 40, it's harder for them to run, right? We see the young children who are young, young people who are in their 18 to 22, they're often in their peak years to win gold medals. I've, you know, many of you who are fast and probably in your 30s, if you went to the Clarence School of Sports, you probably wouldn't be able to beat uh, Ajay who won the gold medals. When you're in your, those years, you are in your prime of your age. And think about that same stamina being applied when you're in, the, in your youth to the kingdom of God, so that as you get older, it isn't that you're giving the dregs of your life to God when you're in your 30s, sorry, 40, 50, 60. We've heard many times that, and use this example here, where people feel like I will live a good full life, and when I'm 60, then I will serve the Lord. And you've heard this example of it's almost like inviting a guest to your home, offering them tea, you drink the entire cup, and then you give them what's the black particles that are the end. Think that we can have these goals in our life that are first set on winning the gold medal for Christ and using our stamina as young people towards those and then setting goals, whatever they might be. And I've set here uh, a couple of principles. If you're a Christian, we seek God's kingdom first and make Jesus Lord of our lives like we heard this morning from Sandeep. It's not carry me higher in the corporate world, Lord. It's Lord carry me higher into the heavenlies so that whether or not I'm successful in the corporate world, it shouldn't be said of me, what would it profit a man if you, you, you gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? And we know the story, we've heard the story of the rich, uh, rich man and how he lost it all. And when the Lord does have goals that we set for the, in our professional job, it's been my testimony and the one that I would share that the, the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. There have been so many different times where I've, been, I've prayed and I've asked my family to pray and say, I don't know what this particular manager or my boss or what's going to happen in this situation. And often, even when the situation happens, I don't. But when I look back at it three to five years from now, I say, Lord, this was like a channel. This was like a river. It wasn't a big, broad river where I know where it was going, but it was like a channel that weaved itself down the, the mountain and the king's heart was just like that channel. One point it was moving here, another point it was moving there. And I've, I use that as an encouragement. When you're at times of uncertainty, pray that the Lord would give you this faith, irrespective of what happens, that you know and you're completely comfortable 
for the fact that the king's heart is in the heart of the Lord. So I have said a few here. I'm just going to, to display them very quickly and read them as, as what I have set, again, for my goals for my own life. Now these are more specific than values that are foundation stones. Uh, but I'd encourage you again to think about your own goals that you want to set for yourselves. It doesn't have to be ten, it may be just two or three. Number one, I want to make Lord the, the, Jesus Lord of my life. Absolutely, continuously, unconditionally, unequivocally, all the time. Lord of my life, as we heard this morning. Make my marriage an example of a scriptural marriage. Spend quality and quantity time with my family. Train my children, praying that they become disciples of Jesus. Continuously be in the Word of God. Encourage us as young people to memorize Scripture. I've heard this again from many of the older brothers, and I, 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 I wished I'd taken it more seriously earlier in life, and I want to take it even more seriously now. When we're young, we have a better memory. As our memory gets older, it gets harder, and it's best if we can use that memory for the kingdom. Just like they encourage us to eat and exercise, think if we can have that same eating and exercise in, in uh, the kingdom, fasting and praying. Generously giving. I, I, we have a, a Bible study that, that Brother Ian talked about on Wednesdays. And I, I, it's my prayer, and it's been my prayer primarily because the Lord, the Lord showed me how much the Lord blessed uh, CFC through those early years where there was only four or five families that met at 16 DeCosta Square. And it was one small, intimate family, and then now we are here, many more hundreds of us together. And it's been my uh, passion, my burden, my heart that the Lord would use us, even though we don't live in Bangalore, to be able to start something small, whatever it may. It may not result in a church. It may be just a fellowship group, but it's in that setting where we have an opportunity to share some of the golden truths and the wonderful, valuable diamonds that we've learned at CFC. So for those of you who are in a different place, in a different setting, you're not living in Bangalore, uh, and you don't have a fellowship, pray that the Lord would bring four or five or two or three other families or maybe individuals that the Lord can use to you to be able to share these wonderful truths uh, and just be able to just maybe just pray and, and, uh, and, and uh, study the Word. It's been a tremendous blessing to, to Kathy and to me, and we pray that the Lord is able to use that. Uh, always seeking to learn, number eight. As well as doing as well in my profession as the Lord allows me to, but again, as I mentioned earlier, that's not the goal. And when it does happen that is their success, I bring my trophies and I lay them at the feet of God and say, Lord, in the kingdom of God, none of this matters. I need to be as humble as the humblest brother. None of this matters. It's all going to be hay and stubble in the end. I've also had a burden, and then again, I've described some of these are practical, to write some of the same things the Lord has blessed me. And I'd encourage you, as you, the Lord teaches you something, write a journal, write a small, uh, a small couple of pages it may be. It doesn't have to be a book. But these may be things that the Lord uses to bless you. It may be also something the Lord uses eventually to bless others. I'm going to cover very quickly, uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes, the way in which we think about the last part of this, which is decisions. And as we talked about, values are what we base our lives on. Goals are what we set for ourselves for a year or for a couple of different years. Decisions are ones that we are constantly, constantly making every day we are faced with a decision. Should we do this? Should we do this? Which way should we go? And we may not have the brothers with us to ask for advice or pick up the phone and say, Brother, I need some advice here. And this is where we need to pray, especially those of us in our young years, that we will learn the wisdom of God so that we can be, while we're sheep among wolves, shrewd as serpents, as yet gentle as doves. And knowing that the wisdom that's from above is completely different from the folly of this earth. It's exhibited by some of these qualities, pure, peaceable, and so on and so forth. And the Lord, we pray the Lord that would give us in every single point in time ways in which He may use uh, the, the things that we've heard practically in ways we can apply themselves. I'm not going to cover financial matters, but let me say that this is one of the biggest areas uh, in the workplace where the Lord tests us. And we can follow the examples. Here's a picture of Lot, uh, his daughters, and his wife was a pillar of salt. And again and again, you see examples in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, in Demas, people who followed 
money. They weren't, some of them were full-time uh, were in, in, in ministry. But many of them were working. Who Money became their God. They served God and they served money. And Lot Gezi, you saw the Lord, how the Lord rejected them. I'd encourage you to read the chapter 3 of Practical Discipleship. There's lots of good advice in there of how we can live our lives. It is the biggest area in which I believe we are tested. And, uh, and I have learned so much from that book. And I pray again and again as the Lord um, has shown me more about how I need to be able to come to the Lord in, in need uh, again and again in this area. In this day and age, as I mentioned earlier, many of us will earn more than perhaps some of our parents did in Bangalore, in, the period, in, in, uh, in any other setting, because the economy in India is doing so well. It is very important that we understand how everything on this earth is completely, completely secondary to the kingdom of heaven. I'm not going to cover this, but encourage you to read this. For those of you who the Lord has given more, use that to bless the, bless the saints. If the Lord has given you, the, given you more, whatever it might be, money or time, there will be someone in your circle of influence that the Lord can use you to bless. Uh, and it's usually someone who has less. There are examples in the Bible of even women who did this. Priscilla and Aquila, they opened their home. They had a big home in Rome, which was the most expensive city. Uh, and they opened their home for the saints. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, women who you don't uh, hear about much, but they were the ones who supported. Imagine being, as this is example, Joseph of Arimathea. The only thing that's said about him in the Bible was he was a disciple of Christ because he was wealthy enough to buy the grave for the Lord. And the Lord has given us whatever it might be. Again, it may be time, it may be money. May we use that uh, carefully. Finally, many of the things that I hear a lot from the young people is about how we use our time and how do we handle stress. Because, again, the pressures of work are so immense that you're either in a place where you're under immense time pressure that you have to finish things under a deadline and it results in stress, or you have free time. It's been, in my case, I haven't had much free time. Uh, and I've praised God for that in all the work settings that the Lord has put me. I've been extremely busy. I've been extremely busy where now I have to learn how to say I'm not going to take on more responsibility because I want to really use my time for my family and for the Lord. But when you have free time, it is very important as a young man, a young boy and girl that we learn from this simple principle in Proverbs 6. We learn, six. We learn from the ant that is diligent and diligent and diligent. No one teaches it what, do, what to do. This is uh, the paraphrase from the message. All summer it stores up food. At harvest it stocks out provisions. And if you are one of those who are finding it hard to motivate yourself with lots of free time, it is very important that we learn this. I find so many young people who in the time of their early years in school and then in college are not hardworking enough and it follows them right through life. They're lazy and they become often like their parents. They're lazy. And may it never be said of the Christian person that we were lazy because we didn't do um, um, at what was assigned to us. Now, that, that may not apply because I know most of us have a very hard-working ethic. It comes very natural with our culture uh, in India. But we have other times when we're under tremendous amount of pressure. And we, uh, we're struggling. We're struggling. And, and I know I was talking to a number of the young boys during the uh, youth conference. And there's pressure in many IT jobs here to finish a, an assignment in, let's say, 20 or 30 days. And you're told to assess what time it's going to take you to finish the assignment. And then if you assess too um, little, you find yourself being really stressed at day number 29. And this is the time when you're under tremendous stress that you can go to the Lord, the Lord of Joseph and of Daniel, who gave tremendous wisdom to these men of God under tremendous amount of stress. Or it may not even have been stress, but under a very critical timeline. I shared this at the, the youth conference, but I don't know how many of you know how much time Joseph was given when he was yanked out of prison and taken in front of Pharaoh. It says in Genesis 41, I think, literally, he was, all the time he was given was to shave. Literally, he shaved, they cut his hair, and they took him 
in front of Pharaoh and Pharaoh said, here is my dream, now interpret it. And you know how those kings were in those days, if you didn't interpret a dream, your head was cut off. And immediately the Lord gave Joseph um, wisdom on the spot. Are we dealing with a different God today who can't give us uh, wisdom and, and strength to deal with pressures when we have 30 day timelines? Or Daniel, uh, who was given a dream and he had a little bit more than doing it on the spot. He asked for a little more time. Uh, perhaps he, was, he had a whole day because uh, the scripture says he interpreted in the night. So for those of you who are under pressure, come to the Lord in times of stress, in times when you're feeling like this tremendous amount of, of time pressure and say, Lord, you gave Joseph and you gave Daniel tremendous amount of wisdom under, under a short deadline. You will honor me even today uh, to do the best job as I can. Finally, let me share this verse. verse. We, we read this in the morning and it's a tremendous verse that has blessed me. And I want to share this in, in closing and then we'll sing a short song. It's the paraphrase from this popular verse in Matthew 11, verse 28 and 29. And Sandeep read this this morning. I want to read this in closing from the message. Many, often in work, we find, and I ask uh, people, colleagues of mine who are believers, uh, or other men and women, many of you, if I ask you how you're doing in your work, most often you hear, I'm really stressed, I'm very under pressure, I'm feeling worn out. And think if we can take this verse to heart. Literally, I don't mean literally, in, I don't mean just in our spiritual life, but also in the place where we're at work. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out? Come to me, Jesus says. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it, Jesus says. And this is the, my favorite phrase here. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Think about that. That's the sweet music of grace that we can learn. The unforced, the spontaneous rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavier or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And I share that for many of us who go through times of, of stress and, 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 and pressure. May we come to the Lord knowing that the only thing that matters is Jesus, our fellowship with Jesus. Everything on this earth is going to fade away, is going to pass away. And it's so hard when we're sitting in the work in the cubicles from Monday to Friday for eight, nine hours there. It's hard for us to, to realize that. It's so important when we're able to hear and fellowship in times like this that we get refreshed to understand that things of this earth pass away. The, the last song I want us to sing uh, t together is a song that was written, by, written about a hundred years ago. And uh, the tune, the, the music was, uh, was written by a man named George Beverly Shea, who sang with, with Billy Graham again and again in a number of his conferences. And when he was a young boy, he wasn't a disciple of Jesus. His mo mother was a godly woman. And she, this, she left this poem on the piano table, on the piano, and, and hoping that he would read it. And we know the song, I'd Rather Have Jesus. And uh, George, George Beverly Shea, in the 1920s, picked up the song, and he liked it, and he wrote the music to the song. He didn't actually write the words to the song, and it actually led to him being converted. He gave up a musical career, and he just went from city to city with Billy Graham to share and preach the gospel. And I'd ask us to pray this prayer as we sing this. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray you've called us, Lord, to be disciples of you. You've called us not to be kings in high places. You've called us to be disciples of you. May we be disciples in the workplace, Lord. You've called us to be examples, light on a hill, salt in the food, Lord. We pray in need, Lord. We want to be those true fruit, not the false fruit, 
that have a life on Sunday and Wednesday and a different life on work. Fill us with a passion, with a fire for you, Lord. So that every day of this, every day of the week, every day of our lives, Lord, that we would set our goals and our ambitions and our values, the decisions we make to be heavenly ones, Lord. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to fill us, Lord. We pray in need. We pray for every young boy and girl here, every young man and woman, especially those in what the world calls Generation X, the 20 to 40s, Lord. We pray that that would be, generation would be raised, Lord, in this, this time and age, Lord, to be an example, to raise a banner, to raise that torch for you. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you know, we know that you will do as we pray tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.